Gaude amus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. In our last episode, we saw how the Council of Ephesus, led by Cyril of Alexandria, put the smackdown on the heretic Nestorius. In his few years as Bishop of Constantinople, Nestorius had suppressed traditional devotions and imposed doctrinal novelties on his people. He had a strong aversion to the title Mother of God, which was traditionally used for the Blessed Virgin Mary. And in defending his preference, he backed himself into a very strange and unorthodox theology of Jesus Christ. At the council, in the year 431, both sides argued their case from Scripture. But what won the day for Cyril was his demonstration that no Christian teacher had ever interpreted the Bible the way Nestorius had. In fact, Many of the earlier fathers had addressed or discussed Mary explicitly as Mother of God. The arguments at Ephesus reran the course of the controversies that had defined the 4th century, but they did so in a brief and concentrated way. It seemed that certain principles were beginning to emerge in the life and practice of the Church, principles that would guide the interpretation of Scripture and the expression of doctrine. Today we're going to meet the theologian who articulated those principles, and for that we're going back to the Roman province of Gaul. We're traveling to what is today the French Riviera, where just off the coast lies an island named for St. Honoratus, who founded a monastery there. And in that monastery lived our hero for this episode, Vincent of Larens. We know almost nothing about Vincent's life. He was self-effacing, And though his works loom large in later history, he published them under a pseudonym as an act of humility. He merits brief mention in the biographical dictionary written by Genadius later in the 5th century. It's so brief that I might as well read it in its entirety. It'll take only a few seconds. Vincent, the Gaul, presbyter in the monastery on the island of Larens, a man learned in the Holy Scriptures and very well informed in matters of ecclesiastical doctrine, composed a powerful disputation written in tolerably finished and clear language, which, suppressing his name, he entitled Peregrinus Against Heretics. The greater part of the second book of this work having been stolen, he composed a brief reproduction of the substance of the original work and published it in one book, He died in the reign of Theodosius and Valentinianus. And that's all that Genadius had to say. Vincent was a priest and monk who wrote a book and then died. But there must be more to the story, right? Well, the monastery where Vincent lived had been founded around 410, and it soon attracted men from all over Gaul and Brittany. It gained a reputation for great scholarship and asceticism. The island of Larina, or Larens, produced several of the great Gallic bishops of the 5th century. Vincent was probably at the monastery in its founding generation, and surely it was his intellect, more than any other, that put the community on the map and secured its place in history. Several works have been attributed to Vincent down the centuries, but only one survives that is certainly his. That one work, though, is more than enough to establish the particular genius of its author. It's the Commonatorium, and it was written in 434, just three years after the Council of Ephesus. The title means Aid to Memory, and Vincent composed it as a handy guide for distinguishing truth from falsehood in religious matters. The Commonatorium sketches a method and sets forth several fundamental principles for discerning orthodoxy and sussing out heresy. We establish truth, Vincent said, by consulting reliable authorities. First, by the authority of divine law, and then by the tradition of the Catholic Church. He noted, however, that there is no small difficulty in consulting Scripture. Its meaning is not always perfectly clear, and well-educated people often disagree most vehemently 
about its interpretation. Vincent went on to recite a long litany of heretics who had misled multitudes, from Novatian and Sibelius in the 3rd century down to Pelagius and Nestorius in his own day. Since there are so many ways to go wrong, Vincent said, scriptural interpretation should be framed in accordance with the standard of ecclesiastical and Catholic interpretation. That's the great rule, he said, for the right understanding of the prophets and apostles. Now, when he used the word Catholic, he was not speaking of a distinct denomination of Christian believers. Catholic was simply the word used to describe the church's universality, its essential unity not only in space but also in time. The church's doctrine remained consistent and true wherever it went on earth, in spite of cultural and linguistic differences. And the church's doctrine did not change as it passed from one age to another. It was universally true. It was Catholic. Vincent summarized this statement in a single line that has become a fundamental principle of theology. In the church, Vincent declared, all possible care must be taken that we hold that faith which has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. It's known through the subsequent ages as the Vincentian Canon, that Christians must profess the faith that has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. Like Irenaeus three centuries before, Vincent was looking for some objective standard by which to measure religious opinions and seemingly new ideas. Irenaeus situated that standard in the bishops of the church. Their teaching was the gold standard. Together, and subject to the primacy of the Bishop of Rome, the hierarchy served as reliable judges of the doctrine of individual teachers. Vincent took principles that were implicit in Irenaeus and made them explicit. He articulated them in ways that were concise, precise, and memorable. But he extended them, too. For Vincent, Doctrine was measured not simply by the judgments of the current hierarchy, but also against the great body of teaching accumulated within the church over five centuries. The teachings of the fathers bear witness to the faith as it has been practiced in every generation of the past. What conforms to their witness is true. What contradicts their witness is quite likely false. Vincent did not claim that these ideas were his, or that they were new. It would be quite ironic if he had advanced a novel theory in order to establish the authority of tradition. But no, the ideas are baked into scripture. In fact, Vincent began the commonatorium by citing the verses that inspired his work. He begins with Deuteronomy 32.7, Ask your fathers and they will tell you, your elders and they will declare unto you. Following the biblical precedent, Vincent treasured the teachings of those who had been considered wise in past generations and whose reputations had stood the test of time. He honored his fathers in the faith. Everywhere he speaks of the memory of the fathers, the institutes of the fathers, the landmarks of the fathers, the consensus of the fathers. Again, it was hardly a new thing to pay homage to the earlier fathers. Eusebius had done it throughout his church history. Jerome had done it throughout his illustrious men. But Vincent did it in a way that was concentrated, emphatic, and memorable. For that reason, he is as valuable to the fields of patristics and petrology as Jerome and Eusebius were. They had established good models for preserving the memory of the fathers, but Vincent expressed the necessity of doing so. He insisted that true piety admits no other rule than whatsoever things have been faithfully received from our fathers. The same are to be faithfully consigned to our children. And in case anybody missed the point, he continued, It is our duty not to lead religion where we wish, but rather to follow religion wherever it leads. And it is the part of Christian modesty and gravity not to hand down our own beliefs or observances to those who come after us, but to preserve and keep what we have received from those who went before us. His deepest desire was to be unoriginal. His goal, he said, was to record with the fidelity of a narrator rather than the presumption of an author the things which our forefathers have handed down to us and committed to our keeping. 
In the end, he would be successful if antiquity was retained and novelty was rejected. So how did Vincent identify which of the early Christian writers were fathers, and which were writers of lesser authority? In which authors did authority reside? Vincent bestowed a kind of primacy on the martyrs and confessors, those who had died or suffered for the faith. Their faith and their character had been tested and proven. But he also honored those who held office in the church, especially the office of bishop, and he accepted without reservation the authority of the church's general councils. He searched diligently in the ancient documents for what had been believed everywhere, always, and by all. But he also acknowledged that the marks could be difficult to apply, for what doctrine had never suffered a significant challenge, and for that reason, could any doctrine be judged truly universal? Well, when universality was lacking, he directed readers to favor older sources over new. The ideal marks were ubiquity, antiquity, and unanimous consent. But Vincent definitely exalted antiquity over the other two. Antiquity was the principle that nullified both Arianism and Nestorianism. These novelties could not be squared with the teachings of the earliest fathers or the prayers of the earliest liturgies. Again, antiquity was to be retained and novelty was to be rejected. What Vincent proposed, however, was not mere conservatism or intractable traditionalism. In fact, he made a strong case for the necessity of progress in religion. Again, this was not a new idea. It could be found diffused in the works of Basil the Great. But in Vincent, it was elegant and clear. He wrote, The growth of religion must be analogous to the growth of the body. Though in process of years it is developed and attains its full size, yet it remains still the same. There is a wide difference between the flower of youth and the maturity of age. Yet they who were once young are still the same now that they have become old, though the stature and outward form of the individual are changed. Yet his nature is one and the same. His person is one and the same. An infant's limbs are small, a young man's large. Yet the infant and the young man are the same. Christian doctrine should follow the same laws of progress so as to be consolidated by years, enlarged by time, refined by age, and yet, Nonetheless, to continue uncorrupt and unadulterated, complete and perfect in all the measurement of its parts, and, so to speak, in all its proper members and senses, admitting no change, no waste of its distinctive property, no variation in its limits. Almost a millennium and a half later, Vincent's ideas would be elaborated by John Henry Newman in his great essay on the development of Christian doctrine. Earlier authors had done heroic work in preserving the works of the primitive fathers and recounting their lives, but it was Vincent who strove to apply scientific rigor to the study of tradition. He asked the fundamental questions, who are the fathers? Which ancient authors speak with authority and which do not? What constitutes the mainstream of the church's tradition? And what can we learn from it? He certainly succeeded in his stated mission to amplify the voices of the fathers. It's hard to imagine the existence of a podcast about the fathers had he not written his commonatorium so many years ago. His aid to memory has proven to be an aid to memory for Christians in every age, individually and collectively. Vincent made his quiet exit sometime in the years 445 to 450. If you've enjoyed this episode of Way of the Fathers, please consider making a contribution for the continuation of our series. Our podcast is listener-funded, so we're dependent on the generosity of people like you. Please pay us a visit at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio and leave us a note if you love the Fathers. We pray for our benefactors every day. Decorum solemnitate Gauden tangeli Et collaudant filium Dei
Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman. You might also enjoy Criteria, the Catholic film podcast, devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, listen to the Catholic Culture Podcast.